Good morning, Broward Church. Most of you know me, but for those who don't, my name is Monte Strickland. I'm one of the elders here. I serve along with Tom Hathaway, Joe Stearns, uh, and along with our wives, we serve with Tony Cassandra and really loving God and serving this church in the eldership. Today, I wanted to talk to you guys about a subject that's near and dear uh, to my heart. And it's because I realized that this, for me and my wife, is our 30th year in Broward. Now, we are not the oldest members here, and there's no announcement. I'm not going anywhere. But it was just a digit, 3-0. And I realized, man, this is the summer that I arrived from Tallahassee, freshly graduated from Florida A&M University as a single man, and I touched foot in Broward County 30 years ago. And it gives you a perspective when you've watched a church grow up over 30 years. You know, you get to see all kinds of trials and tribulations and great times happen and people maturing and going on to do great things in the Lord. And I thought, man, this would be really awesome to kind of help unpack what I believe is Broward's secret sauce. Like what makes us special in the eyes of the Lord? What makes us unique? It's like the formula for Coke. You know, you don't want to tell anybody, but God requires you to tell everybody. Everybody needs to know, right? And what is it? And I'm sure that for each one of us, we may have a different idea of what makes Broward special to you. But this is from just my perspective. And I believe it has to do a lot with how we as a group of individuals interpret God's will for our lives. And we come together collectively to provide what I call a spiritual inheritance. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how do we pass on our faith and how, how is it passed to us. And the first thing is we want to start off with is let's start with the scripture, Psalm 68, verse 5 and 6. It says, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families and leads out the prisoners with singing. Can anybody relate to this? At such a time as this, this is so profound, that God would reveal himself not as creator, not as chief architect, not as doctor, not as the lawgiver, but he chooses to reveal himself as father. Think about that. That's profound. You know, and then verse six says, well, what does a father do? Well, what God does is he sets the lonely in families and he leads out the prisoners with singing. You know, I love that. You know, we, we talk a lot about Teen Extreme Week that just happened, and you got, saw a video of all the fun that was going on. But what you didn't see was all the things that happened at night. Because all those teens stayed in homes that weren't their own. They stayed in other people's homes. They stayed in your home, some of your homes. And they got to see that their parents aren't the only crazy ones. <laughs> Like we believe our faith requires some, you know, we got to be a little crazy. God has called us to an amazing inheritance. And if we believe it and we take hold of it, it has amazing impact. It takes strangers and makes them loved ones and then grows a family out of that. And then multiplies it and creates a community. And out of that community, God creates a society. And God impacts the society through his family, right? That's the power of God. All right, so I want to discuss a couple of scriptures that I believe are the most profound requests ever made to Jesus, right? The most profound requests ever made. You may have made a more profound request, but these are the two that I could find in scripture, and they have particular significance today as we discuss how do we spend our inheritance, together. Luke 11 verses 1 through 4, we'll start there. And it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, 
Say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. God invites us into his family through prayer. Isn't that amazing? This was not a common thought in Jesus' time that you could go to God and he's a father to everybody. That's not how they related to God. God was the almighty, he was high, holy, and unapproachable. But Jesus brings God and man together and teaches his disciples, when you start your prayer, call him daddy. Imagine how awesome that would feel to know that not only is God the lawgiver and he's all powerful, but he's, he's my dad. He cares about me inside and out. This is profound. And it was a great question. When was the last time you asked somebody to pray with you? When's the last time you asked someone to teach you to pray? That's a more humble request, right? It's one thing to pray with somebody, but to say, will you just show me how to pray? Jesus' prayer life was so profound and his relationship with the Father was so incredible that when witnessing it, Jews who had gone to the temple and had witnessed others praying said, nah, we, we need, we're doing something entirely different than what Jesus is doing. And we want to pray like that. We want to have the same intimacy, the same confidence, the same encouragement when we rise from our knees and sense of purpose and, and direction. They saw something different. And so they said, Jesus, will you please teach us to pray? That was one of the greatest requests that I believe Jesus has ever heard. And so he obliges them and teaches them to pray. 11 through 13, it gets deeper. It says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All right, so Jesus's point here, like what is he getting at? <clears throat> He's basically saying, God is for you. He will give you the Holy Spirit even though you don't deserve it. All you have to do is ask. You know, my wife and I, we oversee the youth and family ministry here. So we always think in terms of what does this look like as a parent? Like how would I hear this if I were a parent? And first of all, I'm a little offended. Like this means that I'm evil? Jesus is just going to just, poof. hey, even though you're evil, <laughs> I wonder how this crowd received this message. You know what I mean? Like they're going along and Jesus is telling us how to pray. And all, even though you're evil, excuse me, but compared to God, that's who we are, right? And then Jesus knows right where we live because he then describes the gold standard for parenthood. Anybody know what that is? It's real simple because we all do it if you're a parent. All you have to do to be a good parent, right? Make Christmas awesome, remember their birthday, and keep them alive. <laughs> That's how we judge ourselves as a parent. As long as their birthday doesn't suck and Christmas is pretty good and they're alive, I can hold my head up high in society and feel like I'm doing a good job with my kids. That's how we do it. They look alive. They don't look like they're hurting and Christmas was awesome, I'm in. And Jesus expresses the same thing. He says, you know, you guys are evil, but you give great gifts to your kids. <laughs> you know, you find a way to be awesome to them kids, right? That's just instinct. It was designed in us. We don't even have to work at it. We'll do it regardless. We'll go into debt in December to make sure they're happy, right? and then stay up at night on, in January trying to figure out how to pay it off. <laughs> We're evil, you know what I'm saying? We did it to ourselves. But Jesus knows right where we live because he designed us. And he says, even though that's our situation, God is even more gracious and will give us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is necessary. How do we have something to pass on 
if we don't have God within us leading us there? How are we going to do it? How can God do this? How can he be like in each one of our individual lives? He gives us the spirit to guide us where he wants us to go. You know, he calls us higher and describes the Holy Spirit as a gift. If you've been involved uh, in a baptism or you've seen one of our baptisms, we probably say the same thing every time. We say, I'm now able to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You'll have your sins forgiven. You'll be added to God's church and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. Jesus considers the Holy Spirit to us to be a gift. But are we praying for the Holy Spirit? I'm so happy that Tony decided to have us pray this morning. You know, that's part of our, part of the secret sauce, you know, prayer. You know, we got together at the beginning of the year and we were like, yo, how do we want the year to go? I don't know, but I think we need to gather the church together and we need to pray. So we got together on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night and we prayed all night. And we have some different things we wanted to pray about, you know. And this year for us has been spectacular. You know, spectacular. We are growing. We are bursting at the seams. We are having a great time. We got half the church playing pickleball. You know, it's just like, where do they do this at? You know what I mean? We are having the time of our lives. God has really been blessing us in many, in many ways because we've been devoted to prayer, and we've been submissive to the Holy Spirit. I think that's been great. You know, there's another profound request of Jesus found here in Luke 18, and we're going to park here for just a little bit. Luke 18, a certain ruler asks him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Is there any better question to ask of Jesus than that. Like there's some great questions to ask Jesus that we probably want to know. But which one is more critical than this one right here? This one is the most important one. Because if you don't know if you got tomorrow or not, this one is the one you want to have together, right? And none of us know if we've got tomorrow or not, right? And so this guy figured out if I'm going to get an audience with Jesus, I better come up with a pretty good question. And he does. And Jesus goes, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good. Remember, we're all evil. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. You know, we could really go through this verse here and talk about it from a lot of different angles. We could talk about this man as being someone who was rich and successful and yet felt the pangs of emptiness that a lot of times associate being rich and successful. It's terrifying to accomplish all your dreams and goals and be like, okay, I'm here. Now what? This is not is exactly what I wanted. It doesn't fulfill me quite the way I thought it would. And I've got room to go. And now what do I do? You know, what, what now? How do I spend my life? We don't know if that's what he was going through. Or maybe he wasn't really being you know, altogether honest. And he was just saying, maybe if I can get Jesus to give me the gold stamp of I'm all right, that I'm, that I'm good, then I can know that my life is great and I'll have that on my resume and then I can keep on moving on with life being rich and successful. And maybe that's what was happening because look at how Jesus answered him. Why do you call me good? You know? Or maybe we can look at it through the eyes of, well, what kind of family life did this guy have? And, and, and what, what were his parents like? You know, like, he, he sounds like he's a guy with good moral character, right? He's been obeying the scriptures since he was a boy. How many of us can say that? 
this guy's not bad. He's not a slouch. What I like to do is I like to look at the remaining verses in here. And then I like to, I like us to think about how Jesus defines eternity. When the man heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we have to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. This is exciting. But look at how Jesus frames eternity. Is it a place? No. Is it a time? Apparently not. He says we'll fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come. It's timeless. Is it exactly an amount? It doesn't say exactly how much. But how Jesus defines eternity is through family. If you walked in as a disciple uh, at 18 years old, as a teenager growing into being 19, and you came in and you got baptized into this church, you immediately inherited many times as much as you had before. If you had a few brothers, you now had hundreds of brothers and sisters. You know, you had a bunch of moms and dads. God gave you a ton of relationships that are eternal relationships. That these relationships determine the quality and the power of your life as a disciple. They're gonna be the ones who you follow their example or the ones who encourage you or the ones who pray with you or the ones who show you what it's like to live life as a Christian successfully. When we got here, Marcy and I, we had no idea, A, how to build a family. We weren't even married yet. So we, first we had to get engaged. Then we had to figure out how do we do this marriage thing? And then we started having kids. And after that, I started losing hair. <laughs> but what was great for us is that we had a ton of folks that were our spiritual moms and dads who had already blazed a trail and left us a path that we could follow. And not everything worked for us, but we could imitate those who through faith had already done or been what we were already trying to do, right? And so we imitated people who were doing it better than we were or who had a clue because we didn't have a clue. We knew what we wanted. We had great vision of what we wanted it to be, but no power of our own to make it happen. And that's really how we feel a lot of times as parents. Like, how do I do this? I know what I want to see, but how do I make it happen? God provides that in spades when you become a disciple because you inherit a family. You now have a ton of people you can go to and go, hey, will you teach me how to do what you just did with your kid? Will you teach me, brother, how to, ha how to handle this with your spouse? Like, have you ever had the scenario where you ask a direct question and then it's a yes or a no answer and she comes back with something other than yes or no? <laughs> like, how do I deal with that? Because I just asked for yes or no and I got like a lot of other stuff that was on her mind. Maybe I'm not communicating effectively. Yes, brother, you are not communicating effectively. <laughs> you need to reset your expectations <laughs> and learn how to listen. Because apparently she told you this many times and now she's added extra on to the answer. Oh, okay. All right, that'll save me one less fight next week. That's what it is. It's finding somebody who you can lean on while you walk through this life as a disciple. Can you imagine... Can you imagine trying to do that by yourself? You know, this is why we need one another. 
And I think why this verse is so important is because Jesus is communicating that we need one another, that we're not designed to do it alone. Like I felt like, hey, as a parent, we need to just be able to do this all on our own. We, we, we're gonna take care of our kids. They have our last name. They're our responsibility. We're gonna do this and it's gonna be great. But there is no way for you to take care of your kids all by your lonesome as even just two parents, let alone one, right? You need a village, right? You need a group of people with more eyes than you got to keep track of what's going on with your youngins. That's why Teen Extreme Week is so, so amazing. It's not that the kids are running around having fun. What it is is it's great that they've got other eyes that see things you don't see. See things that you assume are going on that aren't going on, things that are going on that you didn't know were going on. And it's just, it helps us, right, in so many ways, right? The more eyes and ears you have, the better. And then somebody can come ask you questions like, I notice your kid does this when you do this. You need to do less of that, do more of mm, that, and listen. I'm like, wow, that's profound. I need to listen to them? Yeah, bro, that really helps. You know, if you listen to what they're telling you and you just do this, don't, don't respond. Develop a poker face. No matter what they tell you, no matter how bad it is, you've got to stand there like, that's unique. And later, separately, you go pray. You call and get advice. And then you come back and you have a constructive conversation. The last thing you want to do is what? Flip out. Because I'll never talk to you again. (laughs) Man, family is essential for passing on and helping us take care of one another. And that's how our faith is built. That's how God transfers his love through the ages down to us. Another place where I think we need help and that we get encouragement from Jesus, I think, is this whole idea that when we get help, it's also a form of getting training, right? We need training. The Bible says that it is good for teaching. All scriptures God breathes and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. We need training to do this effectively, to live this life as disciples. I need training. That's what I definitely didn't think Christianity was involved in any kind of training. It should just work, right? I should just show up. The spirit should arrive. Awesomeness should happen. And then I go home. I should have to do nothing because, you know, you hear about all these miracles and that's what a miracle looks like to me. What a miracle looks like to God is, I come to church, I love somebody else, I serve somebody else, I develop a relationship, I go home, and I continue living the Christian life. And God uses trials and challenges and good times and bad times to mold my character and make me more like Jesus. That's a miracle. Us looking like Jesus is a miracle. And that is his design, but it takes training. That means I got to come back and do it again, fail, get corrected, try to make the changes I need to make, try it again, maybe get it right, get encouragement, try something a little bit harder the next time. And it's this process that God puts us through. You know, Peter says something here that I think (laughs) makes me feel like Peter thought he was rich. The rich man goes, he walks away sad because he has great wealth. Jesus says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The people that hear that go, well, then who then can be saved? If the rich guy that's got five of the Ten Commandments down pat can't make it, we're doomed. Then God or Jesus encourages them and said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter is not encouraged. He goes, we've left everything to follow you. And then Jesus follows up with this incredible encouragement. Truly, I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God 
will fail to receive many times as much in this life and in the life to come, eternal life. You know, all of these people were shook. The man walked away shook. He thought he was going to come in and get a compliment from Jesus. Hey, you're doing great. Keep doing. You're rocking. He didn't get that answer. So he walks away sad. The people find out that it's actually, if it's hard for him, how can anybody be saved? Because at that time, if God bless you materially, obviously you're doing well. If you're poor or something bad happened to you, obviously you ain't living right. And so they're looking at this guy like he's a shoe in. Then Peter follows up with, well, if that is not good, then I'm definitely not going to make it. Right? I'm definitely done, and I've emptied my pockets. I've given everything that I have to follow you because the disciples have given everything they have to follow him. You know, this is why God calls us into communion uh, with him. And in a little while, we're going to talk about the communion. But imagine the trade that Jesus says is required of us here in this passage. You know, God bankrupts heaven and gives us his everything. Up front, before you or me or anyone decided, hey, I'm gonna follow God, I'm gonna do what he says. Before any of that, God gives us his everything. And what does he require? Our everything. That is salvation's trade. God's everything for our everything. And it is for us the best trade ever. Right? Because no matter what you got in the bank, no matter how much your house is worth and what you're carrying on you right now, it does not come close to the value of Jesus in God's sight. Right? None of us is stepping off of a throne to follow Jesus. Right? So for us as disciples, we know this is the trade God calls me to give everything because he gave everything. And what does that look like? Does that mean I gotta go and just sign over a check to the church? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. In fact, he probably wants you to keep what you have, but to use it for godly purposes. You know, when we're praying Jesus is Lord, that means he's Lord of our stuff, all of it, right? And what, we, what do we get out of it? He's generous. A hundred times more, it says in Matthew's version of this, than what we put in. Would you do that deal? Would you take that deal on? Would you want to inherit something a hundred times more than what you put in? Under normal circumstances, would that be something that would be attractive to us? For most people, that's awesome. In the stock market today, you might get what? Seven... 9% return, what's the S&P 500 lately? If you decide I'm gonna be conservative, I'm gonna to go to the bank, I'll get a certificate of deposit. How much are those going for now? Four, 5% maybe, okay. Maybe you're an independent business person, you're an entrepreneur, right? And you're into some incredible risky type investments, but they're yielding you what? 20%? Is anybody in the world giving you 100%? This is bold. This is a bold statement. This is a profound statement. Jesus describes not only an eternal life that's in heaven, but one that's on earth that's 100 times more than anything that you can hold. Would you take him up on that offer? And if you're a parent, you're looking at like, well, I wonder what his parents thought. They, they obviously taught him right. Isn't it, isn't it kind of odd that he has five of the commandments? What were the other five? You might know what the other five commandments were that weren't mentioned out of the ten. Love the Lord your God. No other idols. No images. Honor the Sabbath. And then I think the one that wasn't mentioned was, and no coveting others' possessions. I wonder if Jesus had set those, what would happen to the rich young ruler here? Maybe not as confident in how he'd obeyed those. Who knows? We don't know. But I think those are the ones 
that speak to us realizing that God ultimately is our treasure. You know, what's in heaven awaiting us? The Lord. That's what, that's what makes it valuable. It's who's there, not what's there. And he tells us that God is so gracious that he blesses us on this side just as much as he does on the other side. That is awesome. That's an incredible thing. So I did a little research because I said, well, if I wanted to give an inheritance, how would I go about doing it? And so I looked up some, some different banks, some different financial advisors, and I go, how would they advise me to build an inheritance? All right, I blanked out their name. I didn't want to promote them here. You'd all be signing up. But look, check out what this says. Sharing wealth too freely with your children or attaching hard and fast rules to accessing your wealth may have an unintended negative impact on their motivation to work hard and forge their own paths in life. Implementing a comprehensive wealth plan with constructive guidance for how beneficiaries can put their wealth to work will not only help to educate them on investing, but will also instill in them a curiosity to explore entrepreneurial endeavors and career opportunities. I doubt it. (laughs) But it's funny that they would actually put this in the advertisement. Like, you know, you don't want to give your kids money too soon because they might just spend it all and not really properly use it and it'll run out. And that probably does happen. People hit the lottery and you find out years later, they're just as broke as they were before they hit the lottery. So this is probably a true statement because this is just us with money. We're not really good with it. But I thought it was funny that they mentioned the kids in this brochure. Now this one was a little different. What are some ways to foster family culture? And this is from a financial uh, institution. And they talk about developing a family office, kind of gathering the kids in and educating them to the process. And it says the family office might also establish a process for onboarding younger family members when they're in their late teens or 20s. They can be educated about the operations of the family office, its mission, its assets, roles of staff and family members. Education includes helping them develop the skills they'll need to one day lead the organization and family. We found that younger family members, when engaged this way, tend to be conscientious, thoughtful, eager to become part of what their parents have built. You know, there's probably some truth to this. And there's probably truth to both of, both of those examples. Our challenge is, how do we have a spirit, a spiritual inheritance that we're both experiencing ourselves and we're able to give away? We're able to give down to second and third generations. You know, we want to see the church continue to flourish and grow. How can we be effective givers of the inheritance that God has given us? And that's us on the receiving end. But then what about who's in your hundred? You know, God says he'll give us a hundred times as much. And we know that that's fathers and mothers and wives, children, brothers and sisters. That means I'm a part of somebody's hundred in here. You know, that means you're a part of somebody's hundred and somebody's a part of yours. How are we investing in one another? You know, that's a challenge for us to see somebody else's needs above our own and invest in those people. You know, the role of the eldership, I kind of coined a phrase an elder is someone who is successfully making others successful. That's really our goal. How to help someone walk in the Christian life successfully and then have them do the same thing. Help someone else to be successful. And if we all do this, imagine where we'd be. Imagine where your family would be. Imagine where your family's family would be. Imagine where the church would be after a few years. It's amazing to think all of the things that God could do if you and I are investing in one another and taking an inheritance and passing it on in faithful ways. Lastly, I think, just to close and prepare for the communion, First Peter, he summarizes some of these thoughts very effectively. And he says in First Peter 1, verse 17 through 19, He says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect. 
You know, the Bible says during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he prayed with loud cries and tears, and he was heard out of reverent submission. You know, Hebrews 5, 7. So this idea that we know we call on a father who judges our work, that we're on the hook for some work. And it says that we live out our time on this planet as foreigners in reverent fear. Not in terror, but in the fear of the Lord. You know, the respect and the reverence for God. Loving him, praying to him, just like Jesus did, in such a way that it inspires those around us to inquire about God. To have a conviction about the work that God has placed in our hearts that we execute on that in such a way that we make God proud when he comes to meet us. And because we are mindful that we weren't redeemed with perishable things like gold or silver, even though I might have been cool with being redeemed with some gold and some silver, that is the empty way of life that was handed down by our forefathers. It sounds good because that's what I received. You know, if you can measure your life in dollars and cents, it's a high bet that your life's a little empty. But if you can measure your life in how God is blessing you and, and showing you how to live life like Jesus did, you probably have an incredible life to talk about. And then he says, we were redeemed not with those things that are perishable, but with the precious blood of Christ, the land without blemish or defect. So in review, I think we have a few things from this scripture that we can take away. Number one, do not fear the fear of the Lord. You know, the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord in every book in the Bible. And it is always good. You know, the fear of the Lord inspires us to stay humble. The fear of the Lord inspires us to stay focused. And the fear of the Lord inspires us to persevere even when things get hard. Two, pray consistently for the Holy Spirit, the help of the Holy Spirit. We need to do more than what we think we can do. And it's by, not by our own strength or intellect, but by the power of the Spirit. And we need that help. Three, get training. The best place for us a lot of times to get training is in our community groups. But we also have an incredible opportunity on our midweeks to hear from the best trainers in the business. Our midweek trainers, they put in a ton of work to make sure the classes that they're offering are legitimately scholarly level, collegiate level, things you can really trust in and implement wholeheartedly. And they're the best trainers in the business. You know, if you wanna do well spiritually and you wanna grow, those are the folks that you wanna ask about how to grow spiritually in the Lord and get training. Lastly, invest what you can in the ministry where you're at. You know, we have many ministries here in the Broward Church. You know, God has given us his family for us to be a part of it, but he also gives us these small communities. You know, you've got the singles ministry, Undivided. They're an incredible group of singles. They have a great time doing what they do. The campus is growing and thriving, doing all that it's, it's supposed to do. You've heard about the teens a lot uh, with Teen Extreme Week and all that they got going on. And then you have the rest of us that are married and learning how to be great examples for the church. Uh, wherever you fit in best is where you need to invest. I'm glad that rhymed. <laughs> because God calls us to spend ourselves on behalf of investing into this inheritance that passes on and multiplies out to our communities. You know, God has incredible plans for us. We've gotten this far in, a, in having an incredible year and we're only uh, through July. We still got August on through December and there's no telling what God is going to do for the rest of our year. But he's been so faithful in answering prayer and helping people overcome issues and obstacles and seeing people come in as new births into our church. I think for us, that means that we have a commitment that we need to make to them that we're gonna be there for them as a support system, as brothers and sisters who care about them and love, love them, and that we have vision for them on what they can be and we're there to help them get there. I think that's why God gave, that's what God gave us 
I think that's what we need to give to them. I think that's what's pleasing to God. And I want to thank you for your time this morning. We're going to pray for our communion. Let's focus on the fact that we've been redeemed, not by the empty things in life, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. God, we're so excited that you leave us an inheritance. Father, that it's not with perishable things that fade away, that can be stolen, uh, that can be lost, or that lose value through inflation. But rather, God, you gave us the precious blood of your son. Father, you traded your everything for our everything. And as we drink this juice that represents that blood, and as we eat the bread that represents his body that was broken for us, help us to remember the cost of what's been done for us. And help us to rejoice that you love us so much, but also, God, to live in total reverent submission to you, knowing that you're expecting us to, to love you back, to give back to you, Father, the way that you've given us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Father, for the way that he encourages us, for the way that he knows exactly who we are, our weaknesses, our strengths, and everything in between, and is willing to call us brother, willing to call us a, a child of God, just like he is. We're so grateful that he has shared us with you, a father to the fatherless, uh, a defender of widows in your holy place, God. Uh, you have set us in your family and loved us incredibly, and we want to thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.